From the mess hall of the Joliet Correctional Facility, it's the IGN DigiGuys. Please welcome two men on a mission from God, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. You're like Dean Martin, you know that? I am. You just you just show up at the exact moment when the show begins, and uh, you, you're just gonna wing it. Don't you get <laughs> don't you get the sense that like Sinatra was the genius, but like Dean Martin, he could have been more, could have been better. Sure, sure, but he I was mean, having he was too. Cool, he was having, but he was having too good of a time. You know, you know that was the thing with his shows. You realize that everybody else worked their butts off for five days. Uh, with no Dean, just d- doing up cue cards and working up sketches and bits and writing things and, uh, you know, just the, the set. And then suddenly at like 4 p.m. on uh, the day of taping, uh, Dean comes wandering and just says, all right, let's go, uh, whatever we're doing. And, and yeah, he, but you do be. And that's why, that's why he's, he's, he's screwing up cue cards and, you know, w- breaking the fourth wall to correct the cue, read the cue cards with glasses on and doing all that wacky stuff that made the show so popular. He's awesome. <laughs> Just, By the way, you know what? Uh, anyway. you, do you, you realize what it was two days ago? Uh, I, it, 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 it was your very first Father's Day. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Speaking of uh, what? Yeah, it's well, exciting. Whatever. I know. Yes, it is. It it's is. Very, Congratulations. Uh, thank you very Wade. much. Thank you very much. Your very first Father's Day. Not that my, your name is Wade. Not not that my daughter is even remotely aware of that fact. But anyway, but you are. I am. Freaking kid. Totally. Ridiculous. And uh, speaking of uh, Father's Day, uh, poor, poor, poor Jarrell, had... man. If only he were alive to see. To see his movie make $187 <laughs> quadrillion. Dollars. Uh, I, I, you know, right now, Paramount's probably saying, you know, God, I wish Star Trek had done over 100. Yeah. Because here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Par- Paramount's screwed. Star Trek will eke out. Yeah. A profit at some point. Yeah. Okay. It's not a slam dunk, but it'll leak one out. Yeah. World War Z. Very curious to see how they do. Yes, and uh, I could have seen that Monday night, but uh, I am. D- some, I am seeing it Monday night. Oh, you are. I am. I'm very good. I have to review it. That's it. Uh, also, uh, you'll have to let me know how it is. Anyway, zombies gonna be great. Speaking of zombies, uh, right? As long as we're on a, uh, as long as we're on a, uh, a Superman and DC thing, want to read an email that we got from Nicholas Gordon. Uh, said, so, uh, let's see, uh, I decided to take a break from studying to pose a question to you. As a business student and a comic book fan, I've wondered why Marvel has gotten so far ahead of DC in the whole comic books as movies trend. I love both comic companies and have always fancied DC over Marvel, as I have myself, so I agree with him. Uh, but when it comes to the movies, Marvel has beaten up DC and taken their lunch money. Now, if I can put on my business hat... I can say that's definitely not due to content. As states above, I feel DC has the stronger lineup of heroes. Uh, we've all seen pretty much all of Marvel's lineup, with a few exceptions of the like Punisher and Daredevil. They've all been you know hundred million dollar hits. I mean, you could throw Elektra in there as, as one of the stinkers. Uh, and all we've seen from DC is the Dark Knight trilogy, and of course now uh, Superman. Uh, and then Catwoman, Green Lantern, Jonah Hex were critical and commercial flops. Why is it that DC has been so slow to adapt comics to movies? And how have Daredevil and Thor made it to movies before Wonder Woman and The Flash? This business model is even more inexcusable when you realize that Warner Brothers, one of the biggest movie studios uh, who owns DC and can make whatever they want to. Um, so, yeah. And, and, of course, he goes on to ask about, you know, the Justice League movie. And, uh, y- you know... it was You know what it was to me? It was Iron Man. Not even Spider-Man. Iron Man showed that you could take a, 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 a B-level Marvel or comic book property... And make it into just a really cool movie. You, you know, I'm, I, here's the thing. Marvel movies fumbled around for a long time. They really did, before they kind of got their act together. Everybody forgets how many tri- times they tried Captain America. And, and you know, they tried the, the Spider-Man TV series. I mean, Marvel flopped around for a long time. And uh, DC really started all of this with Superman in 1978. Well, because Marvel only really had Spider-Man. I mean, like Superman they, and Batman, they felt like... Like they were, they were icons. They felt big budget. Worthy. It's about it's about finding your voice and then godfathering that voice into the entire lineup. And uh, I think I think they finally found that voice basically with X Men and Spider Man. That's where I think the, the the Stan Lee and and Marvel 
uh, studios kind of finally came in and imposed their voice and their vision and their personality and their sensibility. And then everybody else understood, okay, this is the world we inhabit. I don't think they, they even now with, with uh, Man of Steel, I don't think they've found that for the DC films. I think the Christopher Nolan voice that they figure, oh my gosh, he just did a great job with Dark Knight, let's impose that on Man of Steel. I don't think that's a DC sensibility. I think that's a Christopher Nolan sensibility. Well, that's the thing. I mean, people forget that, that Marvel films are made by Marvel. Yes. Marvel makes Marvel films. But Warner there, Brothers makes DC films. That's the thing. There is no DC sensibility. There's no Stan Lee over there to sort of say, this is who we are. And uh, I, I think that's where it's still a little bit of ground because, you know, we've had also, what, you know, like three Superman TV series in the past 10 years or whatever it's been. And they're all totally different. There, there's still no sort of overriding sensibility. You had this short-lived Wonder Woman series, which tanked. They haven't been able to get the, the Wonder Woman series off the ground or the Wonder Woman movie off the ground. You know, that's been a problem. Uh, I mean, so it's, it's, all, it's all about finding that voice. And I don't think that there's any one person over it. De- I mean, you know, this is not about a democracy. This is about vision. You've got to find that person. And I don't think Nolan is that person. I don't think they, 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 that there's going to be a Justice League movie. I really don't. Uh, I don't. I don't see it anywhere because how are you going to launch all those heroes? They still haven't figured out how to launch Wonder Woman. They still have, you know, Green Lantern. They're going to have to figure something out. Well, that, the, that's the, a big, the, yeah. The, well, the, the Green Lantern is almost there. That's a mess. That that's almost DC's version of the Hulk, where they okay. kind of blew it, and they're going to have to redo Think it. Think about the rest of the Justice League. Hawkman, the movie. Oh, that's a winner. Yeah. Oh, Green Arrow. Oh, well, they, they're trying that on TV, and that's well, not they don't turning have out, to do that. I mean, turning I mean, out so well. Avengers had you know Black Widow, who didn't have her own movie, and it had Hawkeye, who didn't have his own movie. So you yeah, can but, have it without his own movie. But, but fine. You, you're going to have to reboot Batman. You, 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 I'm not so sure that this, this particular take on Superman is the one that they're going to want to go with. I'm still not convinced. Uh, I'm not convinced this is really going to be a franchise. You know, I'm not. I, I, I think that they're, this Superman... This take on it could there may be another one, but I think it may run aground after that, like Star Trek did. You know, it's not it's not endearing, is what I'm saying. Well, that's but that's Warner Brothers. They want their superhero films to be dark and badass. That's their thing now. Whereas the Marvel ones are, but the, but you know what's fun, weird? The light on their feet. But you know what's weird about that is that the Marvel heroes in the comic books they're the ones who are all angst ridden. They're the ones who have all the problems. That's why Marvel was Marvel. Because <laughs> the thing is that in, you know, <laughs> in DC's Marvel, Marvel, Marvel is succeeding, and maybe this is the answer to Nicholas's question. The reason is because now that they've gone to the movie, they've switched personalities. You know, the, the Marvel movies have a DC personality in the movies. Uh, and the DC movies have a, a Marvel personality, and it's it, it, it. I don't I don't know that that's that's good for the DC mindset. I don't I don't think that's going to be what what helps them. No, because ultimately, what's driving these Marvel films is the fact that the Marvel films have wit and personality, and the DC well. films are basically just this, these you know these badass you know dark and nihilistic uh, you know gigantic yeah. effects movies. Yeah, it's 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 not going to work. If they want to franchise this thing, if they want to broaden it out to other heroes, if we want to, if if we're going to be able to give me, damn it all, the Shazam movie that I want, that I've been waiting for, you, you know, and nobody else. Been that's waiting for that's Shazam. what I, that's what I'm waiting for. I want Captain Marvel on uh, Captain Marvel versus Superman. That's what I'm waiting for. And Did then, you ever read that one? No. Oh, it's good. And then what happens is is Flash all dark and nihilistic? Is Wonder Woman all dark and nihilistic? Is Green Lan- New Green Lanterns dark and nihilistic? You, you know, we've gotten to a Stop point now with, with the CGI stuff. I don't. I don't think you can do a Flash movie. I just don't. I just don't. The TV show was was so so, but Flash. I don't know. I mean, look. I, normally, I would say there's no way a Flash movie could ever be I good. Just, but then again, it's, I'm it's, sure there was a time when we said there's no I, way an, an Iron Man movie could. I'm ever be telling good. you, it's it's all going to run a great. You know, the only reason the Iron Man movies work is because of Robert Downey Jr. That is there, correct. There is no other reason those movies work. And what's his face who runs Marvel, who who went out and said, "Well, we could always recast somebody else as Tony Stark." No, you can't. No, 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 no you no. can't. You know, Joss Whedon won't do you, won't do Avengers yeah, two. Yeah, but he Tony but Stark. he's wrong. I, and I know that's the whole that's the whole concept over there at Marvel is that you know we don't want to get married to a star. We want people to be attached to the hero, but I'm sorry, you lost that with Robert Downey Jr. What he did for Iron Man, you cannot replicate. You are never, ever, ever going to be able to put somebody else in that suit and have that franchise work. It's done. Once Robert Downey Jr. stops playing Iron Man, retire the suit. And I know that thought is like anathema to the people over at Disney and Marvel, but I'm sorry, they they, they have to wrap themselves around that. And of course, that's reality. And don't think that Robert Downey Jr. doesn't know that. 
Oh, you're damn right he knows that. That's why he's being such a hard ass about uh, negotiating his next contract. And he's going to take home a gigantic wad of money. And I hope he takes them for everything that they're worth because then he won't need to, any more money. He can just make little movies and win his Oscars for the rest of his life. I, That's what I want him to do. Go I, back to know, those movies. I'm worried of, I'm worried about uh, Robert Downey Jr. in the same way that I'm worried about Johnny Depp, which is that I don't think Johnny Depp – Cares makes, anymore? He doesn't really make good movies. I mean, he makes yeah, big movies. Yeah, but he's... Robert Downey Jr. is a much better actor than Johnny Depp. No, that, I mean, that, on, a, on a level that oh, is yeah. it's astronomically far ahead. Uh, you know what? So before we get too too far afield, uh, too late. Well, you know what? I figure. Well, let, let's let's talk hero stuff. It's Superman. It's all about Superman, Man of Steel, DC Universe animated original movie. That's one area where DC has done particularly well on DVD. They have the original animated stuff. And Even this is like you know old, the old badass Superman. Yeah, but you know what? It's not bad. I mean, they look. I don't particularly care for this brand of animation, but the the writing is is pretty solid. And uh, this is Superman Unbound, an original animated film. 75 minutes, barely a feature length, but uh, it, it's good enough. You know, it, it kind of sits in that place between the, uh, you know, between the the adults and the teenagers. And uh, I think this is this is actually a better story than the movie. And Supergirl's in it. So that always makes me happy. Uh, Supergirl, Batgirl, I was always down with the girls, you know. And then we've also got uh, Batman the movie, DC Superheroes Unite. This is a Lego thing. The Lego thing really creeps me out. Um, you know, it's got ultraviolet for those of you that want to take uh, a, a Lego Batman movie on your, uh, your iPad and just be weird. Uh, look at the Joker. Look at the jo- the Lego Joker. That's freaking weird, man. No way. No, 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 here's the thing. No, anyway, no, no one cares about that. Well, we... this comes with a little. Uh, this comes with a little um, uh, Superman uh, Lego guy. By the way, did you hear this thing that Lego characters are angrier now than they were ten years ago? I did hear about that. Now, wait. Here's something we haven't talked about, which we should talk about now. Yeah. Um, there is, in case you guys didn't know. Hmm? A huge Criterion sale going on at BestBuy.com. Yeah. Now, you know how, uh, like, once a year, Barnes & Noble will have their huge Criterion sale? Yes. And we'll all just spend, like, you know, $300 on Criterions we'll sure. never watch because, like, the Criterions are their 1999 we'll, once. We'll, we'll miss a mortgage payment. We'll risk eviction. Exactly. We'll, we'll, you know, risk car repossession just to pile up on the Criterions. Sure. Well, Best Buy... Right now, dot com is having one right now. Badlands, Sweet. 1999, Ministry of Fear, 1499, 15 bucks for Ministry of Fear. Wow. Tulane Blacktop, you know, Night of the Hunter, 2599, 12 Angry Men, 1999. Anyway, they're doing that. And then get this Amazon freaked out. And now Amazon is doing the same thing. They are price matching all of Best Buy's Criterion Sale DVD uh, Blu rays. Are they really? So you can go to best you can go to Best Buy dot com or you can go to Amazon dot com and get half price Criterion Blu rays. Do it. Wow. Naked Lunch, twenty bucks. Repo Man, twenty bucks. Come on, nice. Now the only thing that, now what blows, and I don't think they'll do this. Um, although I'm curious if they will, is that uh, we have four Criterions to talk about today, and I have a sense that these will not be on sale because they're not out yet. All right. The, okay, Brazil two disc Criterion, mm-hmm. twenty five bucks. Nice. Buy it now. Paz of Glory, twenty bucks. Buy it nice. now. Nice. On BestBuy.com. All right. Thank you, Wade. And there it is. Good night, everyone. And uh, carrying on with our uh, quick comics thing, the on the Marvel end of things, we have another installment in the Marvel Knights series, uh, Inhumans. Now, Inhumans is, the, is one of the new uh, uh, Marvel movies. Yeah. And this is the animated Inhumans, which obviously is uh, paving the way for that. Uh, it's, you know, it's very X-Men-y. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not primed on the entire world of, uh, the Inhumans and, uh, don't really know the whole deal, but they are, uh, they are mutants and, uh, they have this weird kind of, uh, you know, it's almost quasi-religious in some in some sense. Uh, you know, Kingdom of Adalon, and there's a there's a whole kind of ritualistic thing to it. But anyway, it's it's cool. The animation's cool. It's very uh, it's very kind of uh, postmodern and uh, cyberpunky, but uh, it's it's fine. Um, I, I don't know how this is going to translate necessarily as a feature film. I think it's going to be a lot of characters that nobody's ever heard of, and I think you know, 
a little little dodgy. And then a Blu-ray ultraviolet combo on uh, Iron Man: Rise of the Technovore, which is uh, you know standard Iron Man fare. If you've been uh, familiar with any of the Iron Man animated stuff, it's uh, it's pretty cool, kind of anime-ish, and uh, that's cool. I'm down with it. And then uh, also on the Iron Man front, a little less endearing is Iron Man Armored Adventures Season 2 Volume 4. Uh, this is a little more cartoony, uh, a little more for the, the, the younger set. That one's not so in, endearing to me. And then lastly, we've got a whole bunch of Saban crap here. If you, if you just think, uh, screw with Marvel and DC, I don't like them. I'm down with Saban. I want uh, Power Rangers and that kind of junk. We've got Saban's VR Troopers Season 2 Volume 1, which is, is just stupid beyond all comprehension. It's, uh, it's basically Power Rangers with, you know, a, a people who don't call themselves Power Rangers. And, uh, well, there, you know, there are so many of those Japanese shows. That, then we've got uh, Power Rangers. Now, this is, they, you the, weren't even listening to me. Power Rangers Samurai, the sixth Ranger, Volume 4, should not be confused with Power Rangers Super Samurai, Secret of the Red Ranger. Volume 4. You know what the Red Ranger secret is? Okay, so we've got Samurai, the Sixth Ranger, and Super Samurai, Secret of the Red Ranger. You are okay? not listening now, to me. Now, I want you to look at these. Don't confuse these, Mark. I'll do my best. Because if you watch them, they're exactly the same. I, can, I, I could not watch those two uh, those two back to back and and distinguish between which is a, is a samurai and a super samurai and a red ranger and a sixth ranger. I, I couldn't tell you. I may buy some of these Criterion's right now while you're talking about a bunch of crap. But you know what? The original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers season two volume two. I kind of enjoy it because it's it's the only one that sort of owns its cheesiness and the uniforms aren't all just appendage to to hell and just ridiculously. Uh, art directed out. Everything looks just as cheesy as it was originally. There's a, nice, there's a nice nostalgia to that. So that's from Shout Factory. I'd say the only one of these that I have any kind of uh, real attachment to is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the original season two, volume two. Thin Red Line. They know how to strike a pose. Thin Red Line, 20 bucks, bestbuy.com. Go buy that you crap. You got to do that. It's the best Blu ray out there. Oh, it's, oh my God, it's gorgeous. And the thing is, when um, uh, when Amazon had theirs a couple weeks ago, I bought a bunch of stuff. I bought M, which I never had. I did not have M on Blu-ray. Bought that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, what are we talking about? Uh, what are we talking about? Uh, well, speaking of Criterion's, you are you're you're the big big man here. You can uh, unleash your you can unleash your fondness for uh, Harold Lloyd, and I will unleash my fondness for uh, Ingmar Bergman immediately after that. Now, wait. Here's the thing. You know, people uh, love the big silent stars like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. Whatever. Yep. You yep. know who I love? Who you love? Harold Lloyd. I know you do. I do. I think he's awesome. Yep. Safety Last is uh, kind of his most famous film. It's the one with the iconic shot of him hanging off the clock. Yeah. And uh, finally, we have on Blu-ray from Criterion, Safety Last. Now, a couple years ago, there was an amazing um, DVD set of all of Buster Keaton's great films. And in fact, I should probably stand up, go get that Blu-ray set, and a DVD set, and tell you who uh, distributed it, shouldn't I? You probably should. I should, right? Yeah, okay, maybe. Okay, talk about that. Okay. And I'm going to come back and talk more about uh, uh, right. Harold Lloyd's love. This is all part of your uh, your Dean Martin preparedness. I'm so thrilled. Uh, I am, of course, of course, am prepared. Wild Strawberries, Ingmar Bergman's amazing masterpiece from uh, 1957, is now on Blu-ray from the Criterion Collection and none too soon. If you are not familiar with Wild Strawberries, you need to do yourself a favor. It is one of Bergman's most heartfelt, touching, beautiful uh, magnificently rendered films. It is. Uh, it's an art film, but it's also one of his most accessible in terms of just you know good, solid melodramatic uh, drama. I know people who hate foreign language films who love Wild Strawberries. As it happens, uh, Stanley Kubrick was also a huge fan of Wild Strawberries. It was rumored to be his favorite film of all time. Of course, I'm sure Kubrick had many favorite films. Uh, this is a this is from a 2K digital transfer, and it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, the uh, the audio soundtrack, which is mono, is wonderful as well. Uh, it's a beautifully recorded film, and uh, just some of the most amazing black and white photography you will ever see in a movie. The story is basically this this old professor who's on a journey to accept uh, uh, an honorary degree. He he kind of has these visions and relives his past, and everything kind of comes back and. It's just uh, it's just a wonderful kind of existential journey through uh, one man's memories and regrets and and dreams. It's just beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful and a, a one of a kind movie that you just it doesn't exist anywhere else. And people have tried to duplicate it; they never could. Uh, there's a great 90 minute documentary on here called Ingmar Bergman on Life and Work, which I've seen several times. It never gets old. It just puts you right inside his head and his process. It's beautiful. 
And uh, there's also an introduction from Ingmar Bergman and a uh, commentary with Peter Cowie, which has been around for a while. Cowie's, of course, always a great uh, guy for commentaries and uh, so full of information. So it's just fantastic. But this, the transfer is just so, so shimmering. And uh, while I'm waiting for you to kind of get your act together over there, I'm also going to throw another uh, shout-out for another Criterion Blu-ray this week. Uh, we got one, one other one after you're done with Safety Last. This is 1967's Marqueta Lazarova, which is a Czech film. Uh, and uh, I'm, I was utterly and totally unfamiliar with this, as I was with the, uh, the director, whose name is Frantisek Vlachil. This is from 1967, which would essentially make it part of the Czech New Wave. And uh, it's an adaptation of a novel that tells uh, about this medieval feud. And it's a little bit, in some respects, kind of Tarkovsky-like. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that it gets into kind of these, these dense religious concepts from uh, medievalism that you only get in Eastern Europe in, you know, like the Czech New Wave and in Russia. And a lot of the Eastern European countries really have these religious issues that they kind of... Uh, were able to vent in some of their uh, films from the 1960s. I, uh, but I think this is, uh, I think this is really a cool movie, and I'm thrilled that Criterion went and dug it up and said, you know, we don't care if no one's ever heard of it. We're going to go and put this out because it's a gorgeous film. It's poetic. It's uh, existential, and uh, who cares if it's almost three hours long and in check and no one's ever heard of it? It's great. You also get some uh, some wonderful extras here. This is from a 4K transfer, by the way. Really amazing. And also, again, fantastic, uh, beautiful black and white photography and unbelievable widescreen uh, framing, too. It's just beautiful. Uh, it's got interviews with uh, a lot of the principals involved. It has uh, an interview with a film historian Peter Hames and journalist Antonin Leem. And then a short documentary called In the Web of Time from 1989, uh, where the, uh, the director, Frantisek Vlachil, talks about his process. And talks about his prostate. His, no, his process. Talks about his prostate. His process. Anyway, <laughs> it really, really just a fascinating film. I mean, it would. Uh, it, it's very Tarkovsky-like. I got to tell you, it really is, and uh, that goes a long way with me. Hey, All Wade. right, go Harold Lloyd, man. Uh, Wade, one of my most beloved uh, DVDs in my collection is the uh, is the Harold Lloyd comedy collection from the good folks at New Line Home Entertainment, whoever they are. Just kidding. Uh, on this Harold Lloyd comedy collection is Safety Last. However, uh, what you really want to do is, and I hated to double dip like this, but I just had to, is that Criterion has just come out with just Safety Last on uh, Blu-ray. Now, Harold Lloyd, he was, of course, right up there with uh, Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. I think that the reason why Harold Lloyd maybe was not his popular name, at least today, is because Harold Lloyd kept the copyright on a lot of his films. and oh, he, that's true. He wouldn't really allow yeah, them to be true. shown unless they yeah. pony up the bucks. Yep. And a lot of companies, a lot of uh, networks and whatnot yeah. wouldn't pony up the bucks. So his mm-hmm. films stayed a little bit a uh, little bit in the closet. But anyway, uh, Harold Lloyd, Safety Last, fantastic. This, of course, is uh, one of the great films uh, based on his glass character. His glass character was supposedly invented because uh, I think it was Hal Roach who said, you are so handsome that you cannot be in comedies. You need to, like, nerd yourself up. So to nerd himself up, make himself less handsome, he started to wear glasses. Fascinating. And uh, that's how, uh, the rumor has it, that's how the Glass character, uh, who was kind of pretty much named Harold in the films, that's how the Glass character came to be. And uh, Safety Last, again, is the movie with the iconic uh, shot of him uh, hanging off the um, you know, clock I, tower. I heard somebody actually once told Charles Fleischer the same thing. I, oh, do you mean, Charles, you mean the, the guy from Roger Rabbit? Yeah. I saw him. <laughs> about a month ago, I saw him at the Gelsons in Sherman Oaks. About a month ago. Oh, he wasn't performing. No, no, no. Oh, okay, I saw, I, him, I saw him at the Gelsons in Sherman Oaks. And he is just old and hunched over, and I cannot imagine. Dude, he's been old and hunched over since he was twenty. I know. Uh, you know, we 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 saw him perform live a few times, and and sort of hung out with him a little bit. He actually gave Christie a the you know, perfume before it was a movie. He gave Christie a copy of Perfume to read. After one of his shows, really, it was the strangest thing. He's a very strange man. I he I can't imagine. He's talking, that telling guy. us about his daughter. He was going to USC film school, and then he. <laughs> this is a great thing. He about has Charles a daughter. Fleck. He has a daughter. I think he has two daughters. Anyway, he'd be telling us he'd be doing his little thing, and you're kind of like you know, outside of doing a routine, you're still kind of weird and creepy. It's like it's not a no, bit, is. is it? And it, what he, it's pure id what he does. He goes up there and he just kind of makes things up and just he kind of wings it. And then he'd be, he'll be talking to you and then he'll just go, hmm, that's interesting. And he'll pull out like a little piece of paper and he'll just kind of write down his new idea for a joke on a little piece of, a little scrap of paper and then he'll tuck it back in his pocket. It's very... Uh, 
I want everyone right now anyway. to I want everyone right now to picture Charles Fleischer <laughs> having sex, <laughs> and then from that sexual encounter comes the daughter. Oh dear. Anyway, if this is from 1923, folks. Safety Lads is a great 2K digital transfer with a musical score from Carl Davis in 1989. Then an alternate score uh, from the late 60s by a famous organist of the time. And uh, it's great stuff. Audio commentary with our friend Leonard Malton. And uh, I just love this movie. And you got to go buy it. Safety Last on Blu-ray. Because we love uh, Harold Lloyd. Fantastisch. Das ist fantastisch. <laughs> Herr Kaiser. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then lastly, from the uh, Criterion front this week. Gosh, they come up with such good stuff. Things to Come, the 1936 landmark film which was uh, based, obviously, on the work by H.G. Uh, Wells. But this is famous because it, well, and it was produced by Alexander Korda. You know, the Kordas were a, were a big deal back in the day. But uh, the big deal was the... I don't like, you know, can I say something? Yeah. I find that when people say back in the day, yeah. it, it's like this weird little generic catch-all. It's like anything can be anything beyond ten minutes ago can be back in the day. You know, back in the day, my father used to uh, dance disco. Okay, that's the seventies. You know, back in the day when I used to work on the on the Roseanne talk show, that was ten years ago. You know, I you mean, know, it just it just spans anything. You know, I was going to tell you. Did you know that back in the day they used to actually uh, do cave painting? Exactly. Yes, that's what I'm you. talking about. <laughs> Well, anyway, in this case, back in the day is 1936. And uh, this is famous because it was directed by William Cameron Menzies, who's not really known as a director. He's known as a, uh, a designer. And uh, that's really what, the, 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 what you see this film for. You go to see this film because it is just a, a masterpiece of design. It's right up there with uh, Metropolis, the Fritz Long masterpiece, as, from films from the 20s and 30s that just had these visionary uh, looks at the future. And um, this is really a, an utterly fascinating film. It is, uh, it's sometimes this, the content of it, which is kind of Orwellian, is uh, a little bit overshadowed by the fact that it's just so beautiful to look at and it's so incredibly brilliantly realized. Um, but it's great. It's really terrific. First rate, a fantastic transfer, and a wonderful audio commentary on here from film historian uh, David Collat. Now, David Collat used to run his own uh, DVD and video distribution company called All Day Entertainment, which uh, I used to deal with him all the time when that was uh, still in operation. And the guy is brilliant. He's just he's filled with unbelievable amounts of information, and he just knows his material so well, and he does a great commentary here. And I say that as someone who's done a couple of commentaries recently, and I forget how hard they can be. So uh, he really nails it, knocks it out of the park. And uh, some other great stuff on here, including uh, a visual essay uh, from uh, Bruce Eater, who does a lot of stuff for uh, on the musical score. Who does, Bruce Eater's done a lot of stuff for Criterion in the past as well. And then there's this really cool audio recording from uh, 1936 as well of um, a reading from H.G. Uh, Wells reading writing about the wandering sickness, which is the plague in the, in the movie. So uh, it's pretty cool. Really cool. A lot of great stuff. Anyway, uh, definitely get this. I would say you got to have this on your shelf because it's just, it's one of those movies where you, where if somebody comes over to your house and just says, uh, uh, what's that? Oh, well, you have to watch this. And you pull it out and you blow their mind. Right? Fa. Fa. Blah. The uh, Three Colors trilogy. What about, it? oh, it's blue, on sale. Blue, <sighs> white, red, forty six ninety nine. Another treasured tr- possession of mine. I, it's just. Honestly, the first ten minutes of Blue is the greatest is the greatest single section of cinema ever created. Really? Yeah, the best thing that any anyone has ever made ever in the history of cinema, bar none. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm seriously. I mean, Chaplin and Bergman and uh, forget it. the best piece of cinema ever created. The first like eight to ten minutes of Blue, amazing. Makes, makes you wonder where um, where is the Decalogue on Blue? Is the Decalogue on Blu-ray? No. Don't get started. It's a long story. It is. It's a long story. Really? It's a long story. Uh, I'll tell it sometime, but not today. Wait, no here's, here, here's a short story. What? Going from the sublime to the ridiculous. Yeah. Escape from Planet Earth is oh an animated film gosh. from uh, 2013. And this one has an exciting voice cast that includes uh, Brendan Fraser and Ricky oh. Gervais and Jessica Alba. Wow. And uh, Sophia Vergara. Speaking of, did you get invited to Despicable Me Too? No. Did, did you? I? No. I it, it, it screened like several days ago. I know, and uh, their like, well, trades reviewed it. Yes, I, I mean, come on, seriously, Universal, what's up? I don't know. I went into my in- e- email and I was like, "Did I get invited to that?" And what I pull up was my invitation to the fr- from two years ago to the previous one, <laughs> three years ago. I have to, I have to be more diligent about in- yeah. invites because oh, they're 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 yeah. trying to thin us out. They are. Do you think they are? Oh yeah, absolutely. They're really trying to thin out uh, for for almost all these films, all these all the tentpole films. They really, really, really want to thin out critical reaction. 
They do. They're trying to, to, to just like they're, look, they're trying to marginalize movie stars. They don't want their movies to be reliant movie on movie stars. They don't want their movies to be reliant on reviews. They want the marketing to rule. They want the only thing that determines awareness of a movie to be the marketing that they control. They don't want to be at the mercy of what some critic actually may or may not think or say or say or not say about their movie. And look, right I now, mean, it's it's draconian. That's the direction it's all going. I mean, when it comes to movie stars, look, Will Smith now is his shines off him. Oh yeah. Yeah, because of After Earth. All, that's over. I mean, there's nobody it's left. Done. There's like, who's left? I mean, uh, Johnny Depp. No. I mean, but you wouldn't. The only thing Johnny Depp would drive is a pirates film. If he does Tom something Cruise. else, you're not going to care. Tom Cruise would be the only one. Yeah. Denzel Washington. I mean, he's yeah. added value more than he is. You you see it because it's so. This looks film. very despicable me ish. Oh, anyway, what I'm saying is that uh, <laughs> this is very lightweight stuff. It's uh, it's you know, it's genial, genial enough, as they say. It uh, it's definitely not like Pixar quality. It's just a little piece of nothing about nothing. It's about a bunch of aliens and they do stuff. Yeah. Escape from Planet funny. Earth. See, it's about a bunch of aliens, Wade, mm-hmm. and they got to leave Planet Earth. That's what happens. All right. And then at the end, they all die. It's a horrible, horrible ending. Disgusting, horrible, gruesome death for every one of these characters, especially the, the little boy, the little boy alien. Very, very tragic. And um, it's, it's, re- it's really odd that they would take that and uh, you know, animate a film and just destroy the whole family. And now there's yeah. no sequels, and the kids are crying in the theater that I saw it in. So it was just terrible. Beautiful. It was just, just wonderful. Really just tragic, tragic, <laughs> tragic okay. kill. <laughs> um, I mean, come on, it's escape from planet Earth. Uh, so, please. come on. Uh, twelve rounds, two reloaded. Gotta say, I didn't see twelve rounds one. If I did, I, I certainly don't remember it. Uh, so, I don't, I, I don't know how this uh, compares, but this is a uh, twelve rounds two reloaded. So. It, Okay. Randy Orton stars. It's a WWE production. Uh, I've, I've seen a few of these WWE things lately, like uh, I think No One Survives was the one that I had to review for radio, which will be coming out shortly. Uh, you know, I kind of enjoy them in a really kind of greasy, lowball, unsophisticated, embarrassing way uh, because they sort of know what they are. Randy Orton, of course, is a, is a wrestler, and he plays a paramedic here who's got a... Uh, it's it's one of those uh, cat and mouse deals where he's got to do like a series of tasks, or this lunatic will uh, unleash holy hell and kill people. And um, you know what? It's totally serviceable. It's not badly acted. It's uh, it's totally boilerplate. But I I respect the fact that they're like you know this is what we do, and we're not going to stretch. We're just going to do it as well as we possibly can and as well as our audience expects, and uh, we're not going to make it PG-13 and light. We're going to go all the way. We're going to make it just bloody and brutal, and we're going to give our fans exactly what they're expecting. And I, there's a certain integrity. There's a certain kind of uh, redneck integrity to that, and I, I respect that. This is a Blu-ray DVD digital HD ultraviolet combo set. I don't know you're going to want to carry this around on your iPad and let the children see it, but um, yeah, you know, um, it is what it is. 12 rounds, too. It's a thing. It's a, it's a, it's a deal and a thing. Uh, quartet. <laughs> Dustin wait, wait, wait. It's a deal and a thing? It's a deal and a thing. Bizarre. Quartet, Dustin Hoffman's directing debut. Can Yay. you believe it took, it took him all this time to do this? I love him. I, my goodness. He's the best. Uh, a good friend, Claudia Puig, with whom I am often on the, uh, on the radio, says it very well in the poll quote that's on the cover. Dustin Hoffman directs with elegance, and I could not agree more. I thought this was a really sweet film. It is, uh, it, it is very theatrical. Um, it's based on a play, so that should be no surprise. But Ronald Harwood wrote the play, and Harwood is such a wonderful writer that it translates rather seamlessly to the screen, and they open it up a little bit. It's basically about a uh, rest home for retired musicians, and uh, the a lot of the... Um, the old histories that come surfacing to the top when uh, when an old diva played by Maggie Smith uh, finally makes the decision to uh, you know give up her independence and go into this rest home and of course they all have a history together they've all worked together and there are you know romantic uh, entanglements and things from the past and uh, it's just really beautifully done Billy Connolly is great comic relief Michael Gambon is terrific uh, Tom Courtney who I, I I've seen so rarely in movies in the last 20 years is still just in peak form you know he's so good in Dr. Zhivago and he's still so good here and uh, it's just it's a delightful movie and Dustin Hoffman does a wonderful job of kind of uh, making sure that everything just bounces along breezily but never too light 
and Pauline Collins, just such a delight. I, I just think this is a great movie. I thoroughly enjoyed it. A lot of people uh, tried to poo-poo it as being uh, coming on the coattails of the best exotic Marigold Hotel. Oh, it's another movie about old people and boo-hoo for them. But you know what? Screw you. I like old people. The best exotic, and it's and it's and it's, not, it's it's great. It's Blu-ray, and it's uh, it's very nicely transferred. I'm I mean I'm thrilled. You know, Anchor Bay did a lovely job on this, and they're doing all, they're doing all the Weinstein Company stuff now. And Anchor Bay is really uh, they're doing right by them. So Weinstein, keep using Anchor Bay. We should make a list of like major studios, yeah, whose Blu-rays and DVDs are being produced and distributed, yes, by third-party companies, yes, especially Paramount. Mm-hmm. Paramount, it seems to care so little about their library. They don't care at all. That's why they just turned over 3,000 of their, their library titles for Warner Brothers to put out on Blu-ray. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. It's unbelievable. It's, I, it, I mean, they literally, Brad Gray and, and company just sort of looked at their library and said, Psh, who cares? We're going to make another Transformers movie. You guys take care of this. Send us a check. It's bizarre. It's weird. It makes no sense. Uh, what also makes no sense is Upside Down. Now, a couple of years ago, there was a film called uh, Another Earth, which I thought was a terrific uh, film from Britt Marling. And uh, starring Britt Marling. And uh, now we have something that is a bit similar called Upside Down with Jim Sturgis and Kirsten Dunst. Uh, here uh, we have a, uh, a strange little universe where there's actually like twin Earths, twin worlds, and their gravities pull in opposite directions. And like, you know, he, she, you know she's on the wealthy experience wealthy world and he's on the poverty stricken world and they have like a Romeo and Juliet type romance the trailer for this looked super cool it did look super cool I I just think it was just you know what it is the problem is it was there's a couple things first of all from a character standpoint not that interesting Mm. you know obviously they take their cue from Romeo and Juliet so like how could they screw that up well they did and so you know it's and obviously when you have twin worlds where there's the rich and the poor and you know living in on different worlds there's obviously it's obviously an allegory but i don't know that its themes are really all that well developed so it just looks nice but i don't know that you really learn much about the human condition from it i mean it's it's a little terry gilliam-esque i guess if you were to do something like that but um anyway i, I just think that this thing is a missed opportunity i would just rather have you guys rewatch another earth which i thought was absolutely terrific uh you know the rock dwayne johnson He's he's made Dwayne a name that's uh, that nobody makes fun of anymore. He's awesome. I like him. I do. Well, here I think he's charming. In Snitch, he goes by Dwayne Johnson. This movie's not, not that bad. It's not bad at all. It really isn't. I, I was surprised. I mean, it's a, it's a total straight up uh, action thing that you know. It's like a, it's like an '80s level, an old school '80s action movie, like what you would have expected Stallone to do or or Schwarzenegger back in the heyday. Uh, back in the day, there it is. Back in the See, heyday. See, I told you. I it it, it's, it's a catch all. Means it nothing. Is. But uh, but uh, it's really it's great. I mean, he goes undercover to try and bust up a Mexican cartel uh, before his son gets thrown in prison for this trumped up uh, drug smuggling charge. So he's uh, you know he's undercover. He's got to he's got to pull it off. He's got to like bring him down. It's great. I mean, you've seen this movie a million times, but really, the, the, again, it's like the uh, the WWE thing. And again, he being a wrestler, it's kind of there's something it's something in the air with the wrestlers. They just there's no BS about them on screen. And uh, you know, he's really good. Uh, everything that that Dwayne Johnson does, even if the movie's not good, I always enjoy him in it. And he's kind of a bright spot. And uh, you know, uh, he somehow takes this familiar material and he just elevates it, and uh, you always enjoy watching him. So uh, even though it's not anything, you know, fantastic, it it, it still works because of him. So that's on uh, that's on Blu-ray, and uh, also includes Ultraviolet for uh, putting on your iPad so the kids can watch him just unleash hell. And in this case, it's okay; it's PG thirteen. Unleash holy hell! You know, Wade. Um, to this day, one hundred and seventy-five years after its uh, its creation, yes. You can watch The Wizard of Oz, and you just feel that it is just magic all over Magic again. and joy and Cannot wonder and wait. charm and fun. Cannot wait to show my daughter the movie. Honestly, Christy and I keep talking about that. We're like, what's her first movie going to be? And Christy's first movie was Snow White, so she wants her to watch Snow White. My first movie was Patton. I, I, I got overruled. Uh, my daughter will not Your get first the first movie was not Patton. Yeah, it was. Really? Yeah. Bizarre. First movie, my parents decided to take me to Patton. I was five years old. And then a week later, we saw Tora, Tora, Tora. <laughs> That's why I am what I am. It's hilarious. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I'll tell you, Wizard of Oz is going to be right up there. It's going to be right up there. Sound of Music, something like that. Yeah. Now, sure. I agree, Wade. Those are all fine choices. Yes. Now, when you think to yourself, hey, 
Oz the Great and Powerful with James Franco. Do you think joy? No. Wonder? No. Charm? No. Humor? No. No. What do you think? CGI. <laughs> That's what you think. You think it's badass because it's all got to be badass. Oh, it's all got to be CGI gosh, and whatnot. Sam Raimi, what are you I doing know. to me? Two crucial pieces of miscasting help sink this one. James Franco, don't like it. Don't like you him know, in it. You know who should have played Oz? Oh, wait, hang on. Let me see. Uh, uh, John Ratzenberger from Cheers. Uh, no, he was he was busy. He was busy doing doing one line. You know how he has to be in every Pixar movie now. Right. Now it's like, oh crap, we did, we we forgot to include Ratzenberger. Okay, just throw on a character at the end that has one line and let let him do it. And truly, that's how it is in uh, Monsters University. Ratzenberger has a walk on it as one line right at the end. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Anyway, no, I, it should have been uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, but I guess he was in rehab getting over uh, heroin addiction again or something. Well, Franco, totally unconvincing. And also, I did not like Mila Kunis, and there's no one more delicious on this planet than Mila Kunis. I just think she's got no... She's Nothing. just not... Yeah. Does, she's not a, just like a heavyweight presence to me. She's just like this no. waif of a pretty girl who I does a, did a sitcom. It's just not you. that interesting. I hear you. So Oz, Great and Powerful to me was just... Yeah, look, there's some. There's there's a couple good scenes. There's that, that funny flying monkey guy who uh, accompanies Franco on his... Uh, journey along the yeah. yellow brick road and it was nice to see some of that iconography be resurrected you know the yellow brick road and the emerald city i i did like some of that stuff it was kind of nice but ultimately the problem with oz and oz great and powerful is that hollywood can't make movies like wizard of oz anymore they can't uh, make it they don't know, they don't know how yeah they don't know how to do lightness and charm they just don't you know when i see a movie like um and i, I bring this up all the time but like when i saw close encounters yeah Close Encounters to me was like, oh. it, was just, it was just awe. It was awe. I mean, wonder. I, it was wonder. 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 It just, I, you, you had emotions that you, 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 don't, you barely feel in life. You felt watching Close Encounters. I Nothing like it. No. It, 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 Hollywood can't do that anymore. You, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to correct you because what? I know Oz the Great and Powerful. I know you have a problem with that. Yes. But uh, this other movie that I have, see, now you have both versions in your hands there. Yeah, right? which we, we, well, we didn't get to the versions yeah. that I have. So go, j- mention that. Mention that because okay. I've got both versions of this one here. And when we talk about On Wonder, this is, aw- this is awesome and wonderful. Okay. I, okay? Can, I, I can feel the, the, the iron. <laughs> dripping. All right. Well, there's two versions of this. One is uh, blu- it's a, a Blu-ray 3D with digital copy. Yeah. So you have the Blu-ray 3D with digital copy, mm-hmm. and then there's a separate version, which is to say the one you'll be renting or buying, which is the Blu-ray plus DVD plus digital copy. That comes in kind of gold casing. The other one comes in a sleeve, um, kind of a green sleeve. Anyway, either way, I just don't don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah. I just feel this movie was kind of a misfire, and it did it did surprisingly well. But I, I'm not really feeling the clamor for a sequel. I have both the Blu-ray DVD Ultraviolet combo pack here and the Blu-ray 3D Blu-ray DVD Ultraviolet combo pack. Say that three times quickly. No. Uh, of a movie that is filled with, with wonder and charm and sweetness. Oh, no. Sorry. I, I didn't. I No. I'm sorry. Uh, I take it back. No. Uh, what I have in my hands is a piece of crap. It's called Jack the Giant Slayer. Um, what the hell? Brian Singer, man, come on! Sam Raimi and Brian Singer both laid an egg. What well, is wrong with this? This is like a dreadful year. Well, the thing uh, with Brian Singer is that oh, now he does he, he does this. It's an obvious for hire job, dude. Stop! And now he's gone back to X Men. Ugh! Like, why can't he go go back to little movies, man? You've made your money for crying out loud! Holy cow! Um, this is, you know, I thought the, uh, I thought that the, the Snow White stuff, you know, Snow White and the Huntsman and Mirror Mirror, I, I, I thought that all of these kind of rebooted, reinvented fairy tales were just so running aground and just doing it so completely wrong. Oh my gosh, they're like masterpieces compared to this. This is just a, a an overwrought, badly CGI'd, horrible monstrosity. What a misfire. It's like, uh, he doesn't care what's going on at all. Um... I don't know, man. I, I just don't know. The only the only thing that gives me a clue is the fact that this is produced, well, co-produced among the many bazillion producers on here is uh, is Neil Moritz, who just everything he touches is crap to me. You know, from from Green Hornet to uh, the Fast and the Furious movies. I, I you know Moritz is a machine. He, he's studios, like Rob Cohen. He's just like a machine. The, the studios love him because he gets things done. He actually makes things happen. But uh, who cares? It's it, what he makes happen is crap. And uh, it's just awful. It's just really unbearable. And uh, in 3D and Blu-ray on DVD, it doesn't matter. It's just this is a horrible, horrible movie. There's nothing charming about it. There's nothing whimsical about it. The CGI is unconvincing. And really, Jack and the Beanstalk. We're gonna somehow turn that into a 
Really? Hansel, Seriously? Hansel and Gretel. Who? who Snow White, what, Hansel and Gretel. What's yeah. wrong with them? Stop it. This is not, this is, these are not movies. Ugh. They're awesome. They're totally rad. Seriously. I don't, I don't think you, you understand radness when you oh, see it. You need, under, need to understand radness. Wait, uh, let's, let's move on to something that is also uh, uh, terrible. Um, <laughs> now, look. I'm, I, I'm not a hater, Wade. I'm not. No, now we're haters I, today. I, well, here's the thing. I think that, like on the Facebook page and, and whatnot, I think that uh, they pretty much have us nailed, which is to say that you're the hater, and I'm the guy who gives yeah. everything a chance. Yeah. And I'm going to say something. Okay. Go I for love it. the Die Hard series. I know you do. Die Hard series is awesome. Yeah. Die Hard, awesome. Totally. Die Hard two, one of my favorites of all uh, time. Of love Die Hard two in the in the airport. Awesome. Sure. Die Hard three and four. I was three. I was on board. Four. It was it was it was it was a tough one, but it did it. It got over the top. So all four Die Hard films were good. Then came a good day to Die Hard, mm-hmm. the worst movie ever made. <laughs> this thing is so horrible. I mean, are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, you, you, didn't, the, you know what the problem with these Die Hard films are, or at least this Die Hard film, is that he, he, here's how they've made the last couple of Die Hard films. You realize that what they do is they don't make a Die Hard. They don't, they don't commission somebody to write a Die Hard script. They take a script that was just like a generic action script, and they take say, hey, why don't we take this script that's not going anywhere and just turn it into a Die Hard movie? Do you know when that started? Uh, Star Wars? I can, I can tell you exactly when that started because someone that, that, that we know, someone that I know, actually people that I know, um, were involved in that. Um, Matt Reeves, who you know is now directing the next Planet of the Apes movie. Um, <laughs> here's another one of my flirtings, flirtations with fame. Um, Matt and his uh, writing partner out of USC, Rich Haddam, who is a, uh, a showrunner for I forget which television series right now. Um, Matt and Rich co-wrote a script coming right out of school which became Under Siege 2. Now, that was not their intention to write an Under Siege movie. They wrote a movie that was basically Die Hard on a Train. That was their whole point. Let's write right, Die Hard on a Train. So they moved to wrote Die Hard on a Train. And then the Under Siege people, it came across their desk, and they'd been trying to, you know, twiddling their thumbs, trying to figure out how to do a sequel to Under Siege. And they're like, oh, let's just take this and convert it. And next thing they know, they're, they're supposed to, you know, write a whole thing about a satellite. And they, all this other stuff was introduced, you know, we, let, let's do this. And so their Die Hard on a Train became kind of an overbloated uh, thing that was not really what they set out to do. And then, and then everyone else started doing that, and that's the reason that the script that became Die Hard 3 was originally a Lethal Weapon script. Did you know that? I did not. Yes, it was. That was originally supposed to be a Lethal Weapon sequel, and it was one of the rejected scripts, and then somebody just said, well, let's, let's just uh, have somebody take a couple passes on it, and we'll, uh, we'll make it into a, into a Die Hard movie. That is just a recipe there for crap. There you go. That's how it all started. And by the way, uh, Matt and Rich Haddam, uh, apart from their, and hopefully this will show up, Matt will put this out on DVD one day, Matt also had a student film that he directed that starred Rich Haddam, who he co-wrote uh, Under Siege 2 with. Rich Haddam played a mad artist, a crazy artist, who uh, is looking for, he can't create a masterpiece, so he sees a, uh, he sees a homeless guy in an alley who has a shopping cart that's filled with crap, and he decides to steal the shopping cart and to turn that into his work of art. The poor homeless guy that he steals the shopping cart from? Played by? Yours truly. <laughs> Thank you. Truly a great moment in yes, filmmaking it was. history. I, I, I actually turned in a pretty great performance in that film, uh, I have to admit. I, uh, I did a good job. I'm sure you did. I sure did. Yes, I did. Uh, anyway, good day to die hard. Bruce Willis. This is uh, Bruce Willis, just as John McClane in Moscow. Uh, what? Nothing. <laughs> Carry on. I'm just sort of basking in the memory of shooting Basket Case, which is what the film was called. Anyway, uh, John McClane and his son John Jr. are being chased around Moscow, and it's a whole whole bunch of mayhem, and he finds time to say yippee ki and I think this movie really was just a labor of love for all involved. Uh, No, it was not a labor of love for anybody. This thing is a piece of crap, and I think that the Die Hard film should just, either they should do like a Rocky Five. No, here's what they should do with Die Hard. They should either just kill it now, it's over, mm-hmm. or they should make like, you know how like Rocky Balboa was like the very last Rocky film, mm-hmm. and Rocky goes back to Philadelphia, yeah. it's gritty, it's over, uh, you know, and it was, a, Rocky Balboa I thought it was a pretty good film, I think Stallone yeah. left it all on the table and that yeah. was it, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. he's sad, wife is dead, it, it was like kind of a no BS, yeah. a real sincere attempt to wrap it up. Yeah. That's what they should do with Die Hard. Just give it one more try. Make it just like the other one. Wrap it up. In this, call it a day. They don't do that anymore. They don't yeah. wrap up franchises. They can't. They don't. Of, the, what they're going to do, they'll reboot it with somebody else playing the part. I hope so. It'll be like uh, James Franco playing uh, John McClane. 
That's that, what it'll that'll be. be the dream. Uh, you know what, Mark? You, you were one of the people that actually helped fan the flames of this uh, this this French writer director idiot named Quentin Dupieux with his stupid film Rubber. You're one I, you know what? I gave that a negative review. Uh, uh, you know rubber? what? I, I gave Rubber a moderately negative review. Yeah. Well, you know what? His his more latest movie Wrong. This is just a no. This that, that's terrible. This did you see this thing? Yes. Oh my gosh! I have the Blu-ray here in my hands, which comes in a nice little uh, clear plastic case, courtesy of Draft House Films, who thing does a very good job marketing their stuff. But this movie is utterly and completely pointless. Because I, you know what it is? I think he believed the good press he got from Rubber, so he decided to, like it, out Rubber, Rubber. Yeah, but this does not. This is, this is just nonsensical crap. This is like you know, I'm just going to sit down and write something that is just so damn weird, it doesn't make any sense. Like every single line is a complete non sequitur, and I'm just going to have people doing crap for no reason. Reason and it's just you could completely everything's random. Everything and everyone in this movie is totally random. And when somebody dies, I'm just gonna have them come back to death and not ex- come back to life and not explain it and just have them say weird things for no reason. And it's gonna be all about a guy trying to find his dog and then all you know whatever. Uh, basically, awesome. Dolph Springer uh, from Reno 911 plays a guy who whose dog has been kidnapped by like this crazy guy lunatic uh played by william fickner who's kind of this like zen master who you know uh intentionally kidnapped the dog so that he could have like an experience reconnecting and he can communicates psychically with dogs then a whole bunch of weird crap happens and you get really unbelievably angry by the end and uh, it makes no sense and you're like i i'm gonna murder somebody because i just absolutely wasted 94 minutes that i could have been using doing laundry that's what you're gonna say this is terrible. You know, I just realized that... It's that infuriating. I'm, it's just infuriating. I had to see this for radio. I wanted to shoot myself in the head. I'm it's, actually looking at my it, review from of, of Rubber, and I think I, I gave it a mildly positive review. Yes, you did. That's what, that's my recollection of it. Damn it. Uh, pleasure is derived strictly from bearing witness to such devilish and well-executed nonsense. Yeah, there you go. Well, I, that, there's this no pleasure a, in this one. If this is an occult item, the word has lost all its meaning. Uh, we got a couple of great ones from Warner Brothers on the, on the library front. Classic library front, a couple of great releases, and I'm so glad that Warner Brothers values, even though I, I bitch about them a lot, Warner Brothers does at least value, <gasps> damn right, uh, they, they value yeah. their library better than anyone else me, other than Disney. Give, me, I want it. give it to me. Give you're it not, me. You're give not getting it. No, 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 no. Thunderdome, bro. Um, uh, Mad Max trilogy in a beautiful, like... Uh, metal case it's just it's cool i'm buying this this right now it's on blu-ray i'm literally going right now. the whole trilogy finally everyone's been waiting for this the whole trilogy finally on blu-ray um now mad max and road warrior been out before thunderdome has not been on blu-ray before ever before it's finally out in this complete trilogy and you got to double dip triple dip whatever you got to do get rid of the other ones the standalones you want this for sure um i love these films i've often said if anyone's never heard me say it on the show i'm going to say it right now if there is one character in all of filmdom, in all the history of the movies, that I identify with, that I wish I could be, that I've fantasized about being, it is Max. Buying it now. It's just these movies rule. They are absolutely awesome. And uh, no f- hokey CGI effects. I have no idea what the fourth one is going to turn out to be. I'm deeply, deeply concerned because I, I think George Miller has kind of lost it a little bit. Uh, the whole 3D thing and whatnot. But you know what? Uh, this These films just are great. And even Thunderdome, which is deeply flawed and got un, un, just mercilessly uh, trashed at the time by people who were expecting it to be something else, uh, is a really cool movie. There's it a is. lot of great stuff in Thunderdome, including that just some of the two great songs by Tina Turner. I, also, I, you know what I found out awesome. about that film? You know, you know, you know what I did know about... Um Thunderdome. Hmm. You remember in Thunderdome they had Master and Blaster. Oh, yes. And Master was the big hulking guy. And, and Blaster, and Blaster was, was the, little, with the little dude, the little midget on it. You, on you top, know who that little midget was? That little midget, and I didn't know this, and I found this out and confirmed it. That little midget starred in Freaks. Todd Browning's Freaks. Really? And Mad Max was his last movie. Was it really? That's right. In fact, I'm going to get the guy's name right now. You? I had no idea. Uh, okay, you talk about things and I'll. Oh uh, my gosh. Up. Anyway. I love these movies, and uh, Road Warrior is still I, uh, practically the greatest action film ever made. It really is. It's just when you watch it again, you just you can't help but be totally in awe. And I'm sick and tired of people losing touch with movies that are totally quotable. There are certain things that when you say something to somebody, they should recognize the movie that you're, that you're quoting. You know, they, they should sort of like, like, you know, frankly, my, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Okay, gone, gone with the Wind. You should know that. Star Wars. You know, uh, you're a little short to be a stormtrooper. Star Wars. 
There you go. Right? But <laughs> no, I can't say Star Wars is but, a joke. No, you can't. I did that on purpose. But but you know, when I say to somebody, you want to get out of here? You talk to me. They should know that that's the road warrior. You want They just should know here? that. You want to get out of here? You talk to me. Oh, you know what? Oh, you know what another famous quote from that movie is? Huh. Zoom because they go fast. Angelo okay. Rossito was one of the many disabled wow. actors to feature in Todd Browning's infamous movie Freaks uh, from 1932. Angelo continued to appear on television and in movies as well into the 80s. One of Angelo's final, appearance, final appearances came in 1985 as Master alongside Mel Gibson in Mad Max Beyond Pretty Thunderdome. Cool. So Angelo Rossito was in uh, Todd Browning's Freaks in 1932 and made one of his final appearances or his final appearance in uh, 1985's Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. What do, you, what do you think of that? You didn't know that, did you? I did not know that. Also want to say there's a great commentary on The Road Warrior, if you've never heard it before, from uh, George Miller and Dean Samler, which is great, and an introduction from Leonard Malton, of all people. Who Leonard normally, Nimoy? Leonard Malton, who normally does introductions for Disney films, so it's always fun to see him do something that's a little bit edgier. So thank you, Leonard, for a wonderful intro here. Oh, I just, by, also, by the way, Wade, hmm? I, I, I kid you not, I'm not making this up. Yeah. I, I just bought Mad Max Trilogy. Uh, on Blu-ray because okay. you wouldn't give me the one that we have. <laughs> well, you know, c- go, just give me the package so I can look at it. Okay. <laughs> you just want to touch it. I really you want do. Have a little sexual experience. There Kinda. you go. Uh, and then also, first rate from Warner, as long as we're just raving about Warner Brothers, uh, the 40th anniversary Blu-ray release of Enter the Dragon. Uh, again, something that we have a bit of a connection to because uh, our good friend Zach, Zach's dad, produced this movie. Zach's dad, Fred Weintraub, legendary producer. He, he brought uh, Bruce Lee to America. He also brought Jackie Chan to America in mm-hmm. the big brawl. So, uh, you know what I don't like about this Mad Max uh, Blu-ray packaging? Hmm. It doesn't say Mad Max anywhere on the spine. No. So when you put it into your library and slip it into your little, you know uh, why? You, you know what you do? You don't. You don't slide it in with other movies. You let it fade. You, you, stand, you throw you it. At the, you you stand throw it, it at the uh, <laughs> no. other ones because it's like Mad you, Max. You stand it up face first. You let it have an a, an honored place so that uh, it sits like this. It sits like this on the shelf. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Facing out. That kind of sucks. That's what you do. How are you going to know it's Mad Max if it doesn't say Mad Max on the spine? Because it, it's the only one that doesn't have anything on the spine. Let the absence be the silence that speaks volumes. <laughs> Wait, let the absence be the silence that speaks volumes? Yeah. Write that down, everyone. Let the, <laughs> let, what is it? Let the absence... Be the silence that speaks volumes. Oh God. Thank you, Wade Major. Uh, by the way, you know what my quote of the day is? The my, my, the... uh, it's a Joe Theismann quote. Um, uh, don't let yourself uh, get into problems with your prostate. It's, I saw that on a commercial yesterday. Joe Thai has been talking about prostate medication. It's a great quote. Uh, Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. Look, not Bruce Lee's best film by any means, but it's the one that he's most... It's not even really a Hong Kong film. Uh, Robert Klaus is a terrible director, and there's some very cheesy stuff in this movie. By the way, the, but, uh, Zach said that they had asked Fred to do an audio commentary for this, yeah. and he refused. Really? Yes. That's interesting. Well, Fred's in his 80s, and I think he just didn't... Well, wasn't they, into there's it. a commentary by Paul Heller. Which is well, that's Fred's partner. Yeah, which is, which is enough. I mean, you know, he's able to tell you all the stories. So no, Paul's terrific. No, Paul's really good. I mean, Fred should have done it. Yeah, but, and he was he was asked to do it, but he turned it down. Oh well, that's okay. Heller, Heller handles. It's a good commentary. It's a decent commentary. And this thing is, you know, has production art and a, and a patch and uh, you know this little, this lenticular. It's, it's got a bunch of you know collectible 40th anniversary crap that you'll never really need. But the uh, the movie itself is uh, is really good. It's a great transfer. It looks really good. Uh, the grain is still there. All that cool funky Lalo Schifrin music, totally lossless, really fun. So even though it's not a classic movie. Uh, as like in the in the Hong Kong sense, in the kung fu sense, like his his Hong Kong stuff was, like the Big Boss. You know, Big Boss is a great movie with great action. Uh, it, when this works, it works well, and it's certainly iconic enough and nostalgic enough that I had a great time watching it again. And the Blu-ray is really nice; they did a great job. So, bravo, Warner Brothers. And it's uh, it's got uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yes, it what? <laughs> that's 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 a game of death. Damn. It's got it's got uh, no, it's got um, uh, Jim Kelly. Who's totally cool? <laughs> it's got Kobe Bryant. <laughs> wait, and it's not the, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It has Will Chamberlain in it. In this top, and then it's also <laughs> wait, got, wait, Bob Cousy's in this. Yeah, <laughs> thank Bob you. Cousy oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> wait, is Larry Bird in this movie? <laughs> You're scaring me. Uh, Michael Jordan's in it. He is. Yes, he is. Blah. What? Yeah. And then I will unleash you on those two in just a moment. Uh, but I, I touted this on the uh, Facebook page. Peter Bogdanovich's At Long Last Love, the director's definitive edition, 
This is fascinating. This is utterly fascinating. This is uh, released from Fox on Blu-ray. This is the first time this has ever been out. Made in 1975, a movie that Bogdanovich made at the time that has been totally panned. It's a, it was an attempt to make kind of a nostalgic musical, and he points out that this was done like Les Mis, where everything was recorded live on set, and uh, using all the, uh, the songs of Cole Porter. Stars uh, Burt Reynolds and uh, Sybil Shepard, and it, uh, it totally tanked at the time. Critics were merciless, and Bogdanovich has written a lot about this because he always wanted to go back and revisit the movie, and then recently he was watching Netflix, and the movie shows up on Netflix in a cut that he, he never authorized. And he, and he thought, I, I, this is not my cut, this is not the movie that we made, but it's brilliant. It fixed everything. Who did this? What? I know. Like, when was the last time that happened that a director is watching a, a movie in some bastardized cut and they're celebrating it? They're like, wow, somebody figured out all my problems and they fixed it. And it turns out some post-production guy over at Fox just kind of decided to sort of, you know, uh, go loose cannon and freestyle a cut of the movie because he loved it. And uh, somehow, through some means that I can't comprehend, that cut wound up being the one on Netflix. And Bogdanovich uh, called up uh, Jim Giannopoulos at Fox and said, uh, you know, you, you guys like bastardized my cut and I love it. And Giannopoulos was incredulous. And he said, really? Seriously? Are you? Are you are I've you, never heard of you. I've never I've heard not- of you. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> anyway, they so they they decided to just uh, uh, put their official stamp of approval on that particular cut. And now this guy, this this, you know, post guy who just went and did some random cut of the movie. He, there it is. Director's definitive cut at Long Last Love on Blu-ray, and it's it, it really actually is a lot of fun to watch. Uh, still not a perfect film by any means, but the music's great. Bogdanovich's uh, direction really feels a lot tighter, and I'll tell you the most enjoyable thing about this is um, Laszlo Kovacs' photography. Laszlo, you forget what a great cinematographer he was. So beautifully shot, such a wonderful, wonderful looking film. You know what's wonderful looking too, uh, Wade? What? These two awesome films from the eighties that I oh, have I'm sure. Head. Oh, come on. <laughs> Now, when Wade and I were uh, young pups, uh, yes. we would see movies like this. Actually, I was too young to see these movies, but I remember thinking they were super cool. I really wanted to see them. <laughs> One's called The Howling from 1981. Yeah. The Howling is awesome. These are two, by the way, from, from uh, Scream Factory, and we love Scream Factory and Shout Factory. Uh, this is uh, um, The Howling. This is a movie about uh, what happens is that this TV newscaster... Uh, is almost killed by the serial killer. And so she decides to kind of take a vacation to kind of, you know, get over with the trauma that happened to her. And then she heads to a place called The Colony, a secluded retreat. You know, it doesn't matter. It's got werewolves. It's cool. It does. And, and non-CGI effects, which are really cool. And, and this is back in the day, <laughs> back in the day, because 1981. <laughs> um, you know who, who co-wrote this? John Sayles co-wrote this. Oh, great, I know. The great John Sayles co-wrote this. And uh, this is good stuff. Dee Wallace is in this. Uh, Dennis Dugan, who would eventually become a horrible comedy director. And, uh, yeah, John Carradine's in it. Slim Pickens is in it. Good stuff. Anyway, Joe Dante, who directed uh, Poltergeist, gave us The Howling. This is kind of a cult uh, favorite from the early 80s. And another cult favorite from the early 80s is Life Force. And I remember thinking to myself, Life Force? I don't want to see this movie. And then oh, I thought to myself in 1985, movie. I thought to myself, what? Music by Henry Mancini? That makes no sense. Now I have to see this movie. Because why is Henry Mancini doing Life Force, a movie about a you know? Like this, this, is, this was this was the, the Toby Hooper's alien invasion, a, alien vampire invasion science right. fiction thing. It just you know I, th- I know this movie has a real kind of cult following, but I, I, I at the time I just thought it was ridiculously cheesy, and I still think it's cheesy. I, I, I it just I I, don't, I I just don't think Toby Hooper is much of a director to be honest. Well, he does an audio commentary here, and yeah. there's a um, there's a cast retrospective, uh, which includes Steve Railsback, who starred in the film, and of course was also the star of the much much better the stuntman. Uh, but this is good stuff. I think Life Force is cool because it has a Henry Mancini score. Steve Railsback, by the way, um, man, I'll tell you that when you see that guy actually act live, it's kind of sad. And I, and I've seen it because I was you know he was the star of uh, Alligator Two. I was an extra in Alligator Two. Yeah, I was in Did the. Did you play the alligator? I played the alligator. No, I, I was an extra in Alligator Two, and I actually was like a few feet from away from him. I, I've never seen somebody fumble so many lines, <laughs> so screw up so many scenes. It's like, dude, are you just uh, like you like the most singularly unprepared actor in history? What's your problem? <laughs> Learn your lines, man. 
Learn your lines, hit your mark. Uh, and then lastly, we got a, uh, a trio of uh, big d- multi-disc special editions from Disney. Uh, the first of them being, oh gosh, these are all so problematic on so many levels. Uh, the first one being uh, a, a two-movie collection of Atlantis, The Lost Empire, that also includes uh, Atlantis Milo's Return. Now, mm-hmm. Atlantis was one of those uh, Disney animated films that kind of sealed the death of the 2D animated Disney efforts. And it's kind of sad. It's not entirely horrible. I mean, the animation is great. It's just not a good script, um, which has been a problem for a lot of animated films, CGI or, you know, computer-generated 3D or, or 2D. It doesn't matter. You've got to still have a script. Um, but this Milo's Return thing, I just, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know why they even did that. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't add any value. It doesn't, you know, it takes a problematic movie and it just kind of becomes more problematic. Anyway, you've got both of those on this uh, Blu-ray and DVD combo set, which is a three-disc set. And then you also have a three-disc set, Blu-ray and DVD combo, of uh, Lilo and Stitch, the original wonderful Lilo and Stitch, and Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch has a glitch. That's terrible. That's just dreadful. And I, I like Lilo and Stitch. I so loved good. Lilo and Stitch. I think it is such a fun movie. I thought it was such a surprise. It's so charming. I get this only for Lilo and Stitch, but Lilo and Stitch 2, no, it's not good. It's pointless. It just makes no sense whatsoever. And then the last one, also a three-disc set, Blu-ray and DVD, two-movie collection, is The Emperor's New Groove and Kronk's New Groove. Now, this is even more problematic because The Emperor's New Groove, not a good movie, even remotely. And they had a whole TV series based on The Emperor's New Groove, which was also really bad. And then Kronk's New Groove, you're just it, you're just piling on. This is just all utter stupidity. None of it is any good. I, don't, I assume there are kids somewhere that like this stuff, but uh, it's just dreadful. And uh, the only thing that's good about The Emperor's New Groove, the only thing that's good about it, Tom Jones' song. That's it. You but love Tom Jones. I, Tom's the best, but but you know what? Otherwise, the, you know these the, these multi disc things that Disney's doing now, where you you take a classic movie and then you pair it up with its direct to, to DVD, uh, very forced sequel or a spin off. I I know that was kind of a thing for a while. It was it was the way that they were sort of generating an additional revenue stream off of recognizable you know franchises but I, I i really think that's kind of run its ground i think people are sick and tired of like oh peter pan 4 yeah blow me i don't think that's uh what's that the name of peter pan 4 uh, whatever peter pan 4, <laughs> blow me <laughs> Not, that was my that reaction gonna, to that, it. that i'm gonna rent there you, <laughs> anyway all right with that we are done we will be back at, we need we need a sign off mark for all these years we've been doing this we don't have a sign off you know fun and frolic see you next week how, how are things going until uh, next mark week. feed me a cookie tell me about your dating life i don't we don't have a what, what's our new sign off until next week the balcony is closed it's been done yeah but it's been done by the best <laughs>